Hi everyone, welcome to Greybeard's Jewels. Today we bring you 10 eerie Scottish urban legends. Number 1. Sawney Bean, Scotland's most famous cannibal. The legend starts out with the newlyweds Mr. and Mrs. Sawney Bean setting up residence at Benning Cave around Ayrshire, Scotland. The cave had many tunnels extending more than a mile with plenty of room for them to start their family. Not wanting to go the typical route, Sonny chose robbery to support himself and his wife. It was going good for the two of them, but one day Sonny started thinking. He needed a way for his victims not to remember who it was who had robbed them, so he thought murdering them was a good idea. Then he thought, well, I could kill two birds with one stone and we could just eat what I kill. It would be a good high-protein diet for he and his wife to live on, and live on they did. Soon the family started getting bigger. Their diet of human flesh helped them produce 14 cannibalistic kids. Sonny had a lot of mouths to feed, so his thieving and murderous ways escalated, and the amount of people that were going missing was amassing greatly. The townspeople and authority figures of the day noticed. The Bean children grew up, and thanks to inbreeding, the family grew and grew. Now, Sonny basically had an army of killing machines out looking for their next meal. One day, though, they got careless. A couple on horseback was riding down the trail, returning from a fair, when the Bean clan attacked. They knocked the wife off her horse and had her stripped and gutted before the husband could even react to what was going on. As he came to his senses, he drew his pistol and knife and was fending off the beans. A group of about 20 people happened upon the scene as they were traveling back from the same fair. They quickly ran up to help the man. The bean clan knew that they were outnumbered and scattered back to their cave to contemplate their next move. The husband from the attack was taken to the chief magistrate of Glasgow, and with his account and that of all the eyewitnesses, the magistrate started putting two and two together with all the missing people. He decided he should take this matter to the king right away. After the king heard the horrendous story, he gathered up an army of 400 men with tracker dogs, and they set out for Ayrshire. Once there, a group of locals joined them in the hunt for the beans. Before long, their dogs picked up on the smell of rotting flesh at the entrance to the cave. With their torches lit and swords drawn, the posse entered the cave, and what they found was unbelievable, to say the least. Raw meat was hanging like a butcher shop, arms and legs were thrown all over in some tunnels, and in others were piles of clothes, and in still others they found rings and other items that belonged to the victims, and bones were thrown all over the place. The beans put up a little resistance to the army, but soon they surrendered, and were arrested and taken to Edinburgh by the king himself. Their crimes were considered so evil that the renowned Scottish justice system was tossed out and the whole family was sentenced to death. The very next day, the 27 men of the Bean family had their arms and legs cut off and were left to bleed to death, just like they had their victims. After being made to watch the men bleed out, the 21 women of the family were all burned at the stake with a huge fire, just like witches. There are publications going back to the 18th century that lend to this being a true story, so it might not just be an urban legend after all. Number 2. The Unnatural Death of Nora Fernario In the summer of 1929, Netta, as she preferred to be called, left London for what she planned to be a lengthy stay on a Scottish island very rich in folklore and history named Iona. Now, Netta wasn't just your everyday person going on vacation. She was a member of the Alpha Omega, a branch of the famous Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which the notorious Aleister Crowley was part of. The Alpha Omega was known for its practices in ritual magic tarot cards, mysticism, and telepathy, and Netta herself was said to have a strong interest in fairies as well. Once she made it to the island, she found a place to stay with Mrs. McRae, a lady who was known for taking in boarders. All through the summer, everything went fine, and Netta was enjoying her time on the island. But by the end of summer, something had changed. She sent a secret message to her housekeeper in London saying that she would be out of contact for a long period as she was in deep need of a good healing. In November, she told Mrs. McRae that she had to leave immediately to go back to London because several people were attacking her telepathically. Mrs. McRae told her that the boat to the mainland didn't run on Sundays, and Netta stormed off to her room. After what seemed like hours, she came out of her room and informed Mrs. McRae that she had a change of heart, and she would be staying on Iona. 
Mrs. McCrae didn't notice anything different about Netta except that all of her silver jewelry had turned black. Netta announced she was going for one of her usual walks and out the door she went. Mrs. McCrae was used to Netta going on her walks alone, so when she hadn't come back by later that afternoon she wasn't worried. But when she hadn't come back by evening she started letting people know. It was just too cold and windy at the time to be out walking the island. It took two days to find her body on the small island, and what they found at the site was just plain weird. There was a cross dug out of the grass by what looked like the dagger they found lying next to her. She only wore a black cloak and nothing else, and she had some slashes on her body and soles of her feet as well, but they were all superficial and nothing was bad enough to have killed her. The doctors who examined her couldn't find anything to name as a cause of death, so they just went with the old standby of exposure or heart failure. Her fellow practitioners of the arts didn't agree with their findings, and they firmly believed that she was killed by a psychic telepathic attack set forth by someone miles away. Number 3. The Boneless of the Shetlands this is the tale of a shapeless, white, ghostly-looking apparition the Shetland people call a frittering, because just looking at it could cause people to die of sheer fright. The Shetlands are a group of islands off the coast of Scotland, and the islanders' accounts vary. One said it looked like a large white lump of slop, while another said it looked like a huge jellyfish, and yet another said it appeared like a slimy white cloud. And one even went so far as to say it looked like an armless, legless, headless human torso. Somehow, even though it didn't have any legs, it was said to be faster than a dog and could fly higher than a hawk, all the while never making a sound. Those unlucky enough to lock eyes on it were frightened out of their minds and were found cowering in horrified terror. One night, a man was sitting at his table reading his Bible when he heard a noise at the front door which sounded like a piece of large, wet meat slapping against it. He got up and went to the door and opened it, frightened but steadfast. The man saw nothing there until he looked down and saw a puddle of a slime-looking substance on the porch. When he looked up, he could make out in the darkness a white shapeless blob-like thing hovering in the air. He grabbed an axe off the woodpile on the porch and went after it. The mass started moving toward a cliff edge near the man's house, like it was going to go over it and just disappear. In desperation, the man threw his axe at the white mist, and to his surprise it stuck in it and the blob fell to the ground. The man ran back to his house and gathered his family, and they hurried back to the site with their shovels to start burying the white blob. Once they had it completely buried, they dug a deep trench around it to keep people away, and then they returned home. Later the next morning, the man went into town to tell the others what had happened. After he told some folk, everyone was so interested in it that they decided to go look at it. But when they got there, the dirt was all moved around and the white blob was nowhere to be seen. Of course, the townspeople thought he was just making it up for attention, but he swore on his Bible that what he said was true. So, whatever happened to the blob, no one knows for sure. Number 4. Haunted Castle Stewart Castle Stewart in Inverness is said to be the oldest castle in Scotland, and also the most haunted. It's a luxury hotel and destination for golfers now, but centuries ago it was the scene of a brutal haunting. Servants working at the castle reported disembodied footsteps on the stairs at midnight, terrible screams, and a headless ghost man that was seen roaming the halls. The Earl of Moray inherited the castle when his father died, and he wanted to rent it out after he got it, but nobody would stay there because of the haunting rumors. So he came up with a way to prove the castle wasn't haunted, and he offered a reward to any man who was brave enough to stay the night in Castle Stewart. Word got around of the offer, but not many were willing to take the Earl up on his deal. Finally, it came down to four men. The first was a minister, the second an elder from a Presbyterian church, the third a shoemaker, and the fourth guy was a big muscular man named Rob Angus. On the first night, the minister was led to the room, and when they opened the door, he found it very peaceful inside. There was a fireplace, two chairs, a table with a lamp, a mirror, and bookcase in the room. He walked over and sat in a chair and fell asleep. 
While sleeping, he had a strange dream in which a big, blood-stained man came in and sat down by him. He awoke startled, but nothing was there. The next night was the elder's turn. He went into the room, sat down, and started reading his Bible. Suddenly, the door opened and a big, bloody, ghostly man appeared. The elder sat paralyzed with fright, and when he managed to look away, he looked into the mirror and saw a smiling skull was looking back at him. He then looked back at the bloody ghost man, who was now charging him with the big knife he was carrying, and the elder passed out. He was found incoherent the next morning, and it took days for him to get back to normal. On the third night, the terrified shoemaker went into the room. He sat down by the fireplace and started praying. At midnight, he heard the door slowly open. He looked over, and standing in the door was a huge creature which had no legs, but hooves instead. It lunged at the shoemaker, who passed out, and that's how they found him in the morning, still passed out. On the next night, the big muscled man, Rob Angus, who said he wasn't afraid of anything, was friends with the person locking the door. They went in, and as he locked the door, the man said, See you in the morning, Rob. To which he replied, You'll either find me as I am now, or dead. When he returned the next morning, he was shocked to find the room was in shambles. All the furniture was broken, the mirror was busted, and Rob was nowhere to be found. He then noticed the window was broken out, and he ran over and looked down to see the bloody, mangled body of his friend on the ground. Nobody could tell if he jumped or was pushed, but a farmer who had been herding sheep that night by the castle said it was just after midnight with a full moon when he heard loud screams and the sound of a struggle. He looked up to see a light on in one of the castle's windows, and the next thing he knew, a large man came crashing through the window and landed with an awful crunch. The farmer looked back up to the window, and to his fright, he to this day swears he saw the devil himself. Number 5. The Arthur's Seat Coffins so, the story here is that in 1836, five local lads accidentally came across something weird and extraordinary while out spending the day walking around hunting for rabbit warrens on Arthur's Seat when they made a startling discovery at the entrance to a small cave on the northeast face of the hill. What they found was 17 intricately carved miniature figurines in coffins, which were neatly set out in three tiers. The lower two had eight each on them, and the third tier was just being started, as was reported to the newspaper of the day, The Scotsman, on July 16, 1836. Most of the figurines were badly damaged, and they were purchased by a private collector who had them for a time before they went to the museum in 1901. Only eight figures in varying states of array survived. The figurines in the 17 coffins were intricately carved human effigies that were weirdly dressed, each in its unique clothes with black painted boots and distorted faces. The one on the lower tiers seemed to be less worn, leading to the conclusion that the coffins were put there over time and not just dumped there. Theories abound as to how they got there, but no one knows for sure. The eight coffins that remain and their contents are on display for the public at the National Museum of Scotland on Chambers Street. Before we go any further, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe. Number 6. The Mackenzie Poltergeist it said the poltergeist is Sir George Mackenzie of Rosehaw, who was a Scottish lawyer and Lord Advocate who was born around 1636 and died May 8, 1691, also known as Bloody Mackenzie. He was buried in a black mausoleum in the same place his victims were buried. It said that the ghost of Mackenzie was quietly sleeping until a homeless man broke into the tomb in 1998 who was looking to get out of the weather. Once inside, he started to have a look around and stumbled upon a pile of bones. He inspected some of the bones and realized they were human, and he hurried out of there, but not before tripping over some of the bones and falling onto and breaking them. He quickly got up and left out of there and fled into the woods, never to be seen again. This act of clumsiness seems to have awoken the poltergeist, and he started taking victims again. One was a lady who had heard of the break-in and went over to take a look. She was standing on the steps when suddenly she was sent flying backwards by an unseen force. Another woman, soon after the first, was found unconscious near the tomb, with markings and bruises on her neck indicating that something tried to strangle her to death. 
After these incidents, the poltergeist became popular through the internet and such, with people coming from all over the world to see if the stories were true. And not to be disappointed, they found out firsthand how real the situation was when they were attacked and hurt without explanation while there. There is photographic evidence that has many convinced of its existence, and over 500 attacks have been reported, with occurrences ranging from unexplained burns, gouges to the stomach and neck, and many broken bones in the fingers. In 2000, Colin Grant, an exorcist, followed some ghost hunters to Greyfriars Kirkyard, where he was set to perform an exorcism. After starting the exorcism, he soon stopped and immediately left the graveyard, stating that he was in fear for his life when he he felt surrounded by hundreds of evil spirits and tormented souls. He ended up dying a month later from an unexpected heart attack. So, if this is your thing, then get over to Edinburgh, Scotland when you can. But be forewarned, you'll likely get hurt in some way or another, so be careful. Number 7. The Nuklavi the Orkney Islands of Scotland have tales going back centuries of the Nuklavi, a sea creature that appears as a horse-like demon when it ventures onto land. It's a unique and solitary creature that possesses extensive evil powers, and its malevolent behavior can influence events throughout the island. The islanders were so terrified of the creature they would not even speak its name without immediately saying a prayer. It was often found near beaches, but would never come ashore if it was raining. While no one is quite sure what form the beast takes while underwater, its appearance on land has been recounted in graphic detail. Some say the knuckle V is similar to a centaur, with the male torso's arms reaching to the ground from its position on top of the equine body, the legs of which have fin-like appendages, and the huge head has a giant gaping mouth and a single large eye, like a burning red flame. One account of the monster by a witness named Thomas had two heads, and the equine head had an enormous gaping mouth that exuded a toxic smelly vapor, with the same single giant eye as mentioned in other accounts. A particularly gruesome detail about the Nuklavi is that it's said to have no skin and black blood courses through its yellow veins, and the pale sinews and powerful muscles are visible as a pulsating mass. The Nuklavi's breath was thought to wilt crops and sicken livestock, and it was considered responsible for epidemics and drought. Long ago, seaweed was burnt, and the byproduct soda ash helped make the soil on the island better for farming. However, the pungent smell of the smoke was said to enrage the beast, resulting in wild rampages of plague, the deaths of cattle, and destructions of crops. The Nuklavi was said to have infected horses on the island of Stronzi with a deadly disease known as Mordachine to demonstrate its fury and exact its revenge against the islanders for burning seaweed. The infection subsequently spread to all the other islands that took part in the practice. So I'm thinking if you ever go to the Orkney Islands, maybe you might want to resist the urge to put seaweed in your fire. Number 8. The Umfairly Amor, or the Big Grey Man. The Umfairly Amor has been said to live around the area of Cairngorm Peak, with sightings going back hundreds of years. While it does have some of the same characteristics as a Bigfoot or Yeti, it's far more like a demon or ghost than an alien-animal-human hybrid. The locals call it the Big Grey Man of Ben McDwee, or the Grey Man for short. He isn't a man at all, though. He has a foreboding presence about him that is not human. Those that have seen him say that his name came about because he has a thin layer of short fur all over his body. Hikers that approach the summit of the mountain are said to hear music playing and have a strong sense of dread upon them. They feel as if they are being drawn to the edge of the cliffs by something they can't see. One famous case is that of John Norman Colley. As he approached the summit, he felt he was being watched. As he was walking, he heard crashing footsteps behind him, but he could never see anything there. So he started running to try and shake whatever it was. He peered back again only to see nothing. He can't explain what happened to him on that day in 1925. Then there's the three men who approached the summit of the mountain. They saw a creature with a disturbingly contorted face that was anything but human. 
the guys started running down the mountain as fast as they could to get back to their car. Finally getting close, they turned to see the creature right behind them. They hurried into their cars, and speeding out of there, they looked over to their left, and there was the creature running alongside the car. The driver looked at the speedometer, and they were going 50 miles per hour. They were in shock and disbelief. It veered off into the woods after what seemed like miles, but was only about one mile and they were just thankful to be out of there. The stories of the gray man don't stop others from making the trip up the side of Cairngorm Peak. The 5,000-foot summit is a popular attraction for tourists and experienced climbers alike. As for me, well, I'll just stay here and make YouTube videos. Why, you ask? Well, let's just go with I'm afraid of heights and leave it at that. Number 9. The Red Cap The Red Cap legend comes from the borderlands of Scotland and England. The red cap is an evil goblin or sprite and is said to have a red cap, and he has to keep killing so he can soak his hat in his victim's blood so that it doesn't fade. He looks like a little old man with long, white, unkempt hair, protruding fang teeth, and he wears iron boots, which makes him very fast. He also has hideous talons on his skinny fingers, and don't forget his red blood-soaked hat. He lives in the ruins of castles in the borderlands where he waits for his unsuspecting victims to enter the ruins, where he tears them apart and soaks his cap in their blood. If the victim sees Red Cap soon enough, he can quote scripture or make the sign of the cross, and it's said that he will vanish into thin air and leave behind one of his fang-like teeth. So, when visiting Scotland, it's good to take a crucifix and memorize some scripture so the Red Cap don't get ya. Number 10. Devils in the Bins General Tam Dalyal, founder of the Royal Scots Greys and the head of the Dalyal family in the 17th century, claimed while staying at his ancestral home, the devil himself would come for a nightly game of cards. The general found himself on the losing end most of the time, but he did win one time, and the devil, in realizing his defeat, flew into a rage and threw a marble table at the general. Thankfully, the table missed the general and flew out the window and landed in the pond that was on the property. In 1870, following a particularly hard drought, a marble top card table was seen poking through the low waters of the pond. In 1930, the mother of the 20th century Tom Delio asked a local joiner to repair the legs on the table and was soon to find out that the about-to-be-retired tradesman's first job actually had been to retrieve the devil's table from the pond, eerily bringing his career full circle. In closing, we hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.